going to finish on, which is going to be the Grand Coulee. Um, and we'll just start with a picture. This is an 1860 lithograph of the Grand Coulee. This is a dried up riverbed for those who have never heard of the Grand Coulee. Um, and it is the most incredible place I've ever seen. Um, we're going to go ahead and look up. We're going to look up this place real quick. So here's the dam. When constructed, it was the largest concrete dam in the world. Here's the river system. Columbia River, which I live right next to. Grand Coulee Dam at the channel of three and the lake that's created. <clears throat> um, the Grand Coulee from the original image. And... Um, Hmm. See if I can find the image I'm looking for here. Before they built this dam, there was a dry river basin. Right here. This is what it looked like before they filled it. And it was the largest waterfall in the world. And it's the math is shaky. It says anywhere from five times the Mississippi to 500 times the Mississippi amount of water. Old dams to hide the old, exactly. 13th Monkey knows exactly where I'm going with this. Now, we mentioned Roosevelt. Um, Roosevelt was exploring a lot of these parts of America where the information we have about them is really shaky or it seems to coalesce with um, a time frame of, of things that are quite weird. And um, shout out Mr. Michelle Gibson, who uh, hopefully one day I can sit down and have a chat with, but um, she lightly touches on the green Cooley and she has made connections that I have been making for years. And I completely agree with that. A lot of these dams, and canals and these water systems are very ancient. Now they were either repurposing, rebuilding, or covering up what was already here. And yeah, this place is just absolutely insane. Um, we're going to look here at the at an old map someone made. And uh, here's the dam. Apologize for the quality, but this will give you a good synopsis. Here's the dam. And you could see this canyon that was here. Um, at places, it's a mile wide and 1,000 to 1,200 feet deep. So this canyon is absolutely monumental. And like I said, that when the, when the river, when the water level was higher, this canyon was a one giant big waterfall, basically this whole northern section of it. <clears throat> and um, we're going to kind of skip around a little bit because we're getting low on time. This is the article I really want to read before we get look at some more pictures here of the Grand Coulee. <clears throat> the Grand Coulee in Douglas County. So this is uh, Washington, 1896. The Grand Coulee in Douglas County is located in Douglas County, sorry, is located the Grand Coulee, one of the natural curiosities of eastern Washington, of which the following description appears in the Seattle Times. Leaving Coulee City, one sees in the distance the opening to Grand Coulee. The appearance of the mouth at a distance is that of a number of houses, or like but one as drives near the opening assumes shape. Stone buttresses and pillars, columns and walls of rock arise from the level plain. Now, like I showed you in that first image, they they had explorers. That, that was a lithograph, and it was drawn in 1853, published in 1860. Now, the gentleman who was exploring, this, this was a government survey for railroads. 
And some of the best books I've ever read are these old surveys where they're sending these dudes out in the middle of nowhere, like, because they're trying to find the best places to build railroads. This guy's description of this place is that it, it was a land built by giants. And that the, this entire canyon seemed to be carved by the hands of man. Michelle Gibson, looking forward to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love Michelle Gibson. And, uh, try to make that happen someday. Me a chat with her. I think we could, uh, we could have a lot to talk about. <clears throat> but as she said, so she's already done the groundwork. So I'll just have a quick synopsis. Her river system dam video is fantastic, and I agree with ninety nine percent of it. So if you don't know who Michelle Gibson is. Jillian posted a link. Um, man, she has so many fantastic videos. Love her work. Uh, but yeah, <clears throat> where was I? Okay, so this is an important part to, to kind of visualize um, as I read this. Stone buttresses, pillars, columns, and walls of rock arise from the level plain. They assume character like that of the sides of battlemented walls. Driving forward, one finds that he is soon within a defile two miles wide and has left the plain, and instead the drive is up a level, sand-parched extent of the count country with a balustrated, pillar pillared, and columned rock rising higher at every step on either side. They may be 500 feet at the start, but grow rapidly, and soon they are 600, 700, 800, and 1,000 feet high. The walls are clear-cut, well-defined, perpendicular as the sides of a house, except at the base, where through ages probably detached masses have fallen, until at the present time it resembles the mounds of ruined granite and marble of some ancient structure. The Grand Coulee is two miles wide at its narrowest, seven miles at its widest. So this thing is absolutely gigantic. <clears throat> Widest or narrowest, it is, however, the same. Those perpendicular sides hold their own with perfect regularity. Okay. Those perpendicular sides hold their own with perfect regularity. They might have been dug to order. So mathematically perfect are they. So again, this gentleman in the 1800s is saying, how could this thing be anything other than, than, than dug to order created by man? And I have to agree. Grand Coulee is an immense depression in the Big Bend Plateau. Driving in at the mouth, there is but one point where a wagon may wind its torturous way from its deep depths in the whole 25 miles of the Coulee's length. So it's 25 miles long, 7 miles wide in some places, 2 miles wide at the narrowest, and up to 1,200 feet deep, with perfectly mathematical walls made of granite and marble, and in some places basalt. <clears throat> Only one other place is there where a horse can climb the rugged sides to the extensive plains above. In the early days, the first settlers utilized Grand Coulee as a great pasture. They drove their stock in, put a man at the mouth, another at the head, and the gates were closed. Now Grand Coulee is occupied by ranchmen, who are most largely in the cattle business. I think I can kind of skip ahead here. They grow wheat. So here's another funny thing. That same gentleman that was working for the survey company for the railroads described wild wheat wild wheat growing all over eastern washington now when you study wheat you'll find that there are like four groups of people trading wheat it was a staple um and i don't think it's an accident you know we're dealing with incredible waterworks and advanced our um agriculture and they're finding wild wheat. That's not very common. Um, it seems likely to me that we were dealing with, you know, an advanced race 
um, constructing a lot of this. <clears throat> and we just kind of walked into the remnants of a uh, city, not necessarily city, but a region or, you know, the whole West Coast, really. that was um, destroyed by some event. And the early 1800s in the West Coast, in Washington, Oregon, California, they're not even states, obviously, yet, but the history is like, doesn't exist. You know, you can go to anywhere on the East Coast, and I have family on the East Coast, and I've taken plenty of tours from Boston all the way to the Keys of Florida. And you can go back, you know, 1600s in a lot of those Eastern cities. But trying to find anything about any of this area in the 1800s before 1840, nothing. It, there's nothing. Now, well, now why is that? <clears throat> um, basically, this goes on to talk about the kind of stuff that grows there. Nothing really. What we were interested in was that first part there. Um, in the Cooley, there are numerous lakes, some that go dry in summer, and a rank of growth of grass springs up and such from its harvested fine hay. Settlers in Grand Coulee have to go far up and enter a side coulee known as Big Canyon after fuel. Bull pine grows in sufficient quantities. Blah, 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 blah. The river being about 400 feet below. Yeah, the Grand Coulee in Grand Coulee is Steamboat Rock, a massive basaltic mass that covers about 600 acres and is fashioned like a big side wheel steamer. One side of the walls of Big Canyon is composed of a steel blue granite that, when chipped off, sparkles like so many diamonds. On the other side of the wall is composed of black, cinder-like basalt rock, and these two dissimilar walls form probably one of the most remarkable characteristics in all the domain of nature, and they are only a few yards apart. Um... To me, this points to not only it being constructed, but that possibly we're dealing with some biogeological formation. Um, you know, Hangman117, um, shout out him and shout out Stellium, if Stellium's still in the chat. Um, but looking at this breakdown of the materials, it would seem like that this this is possibly a giant tree that's been shaped by the hands of man. <clears throat> to flow water and on top of this um giant steamboat rock was a whole huge field of of wheat so incredibly strange um there's one okay this was the next one i wanted to read many caves washington 1936 <clears throat> the coolie wall contains many caves that one may enter and secure bits of petrified wood and limestone, which often show the marks of leaves and other foliage imprinted there over a period of years, the total of which is almost inconceivable. Many people living right here in the Big Bend country do not fully realize the beauty and many wonders bestowed to this part of the world when she took it in her figurative head to change the course of the Columbia River. So like I was mentioning there, <clears throat> inside the many caves of this incredible wall that seems, as the gentleman describing it, to be shaped by the hands of man and to be mathematically perfect, caves all along the wall <clears throat> with bits of petrified wood and limestone. So, inside the caves, you have limestone, which limestone exists in great quantities in petrified trees. When trees petrify, they also they often have layers that turn into limestone. Um, so, these caves are filled with limestone and petrified wood um, and marks of leaves and other foliage. So, I think that just kind of um, strengthens the... Uh, statement I made earlier that we're dealing with some biogeological feature that perhaps this, this grain coulee um, wasn't just carved out of basalt rock, but 
basalt can be found in petrified trees. Uh, isn't that interesting? Caves, doorways, anything's possible. And I bet you some of these caves are absolutely monstrous. Um, when I had Stellium on, again, if you haven't listened to this to, to my interview with Stellium, go back and check it out. Um, we've hypothesized that a lot of these cave cavern systems, um, they, they look like, you know, blood vessels of a giant biological life form or, um, veins of a tree. <clears throat> the, the veins of a tree where the sap and the water are transferred <clears throat> look very similar to the veins of a, of a, of a, of a human. And I think a lot of these systems, some are man-made, some are naturally made that are shaped by the hands of man. And to say exactly uh, which this is, is, it's hard to tell. But when we go back and I just love this lithograph because a lot of this um, has been changed. Um, but you can see the buttresses as they're describing them. Um, other articles describe them as citadels. Um, perfectly straight, perfectly vertical. The entire floor of this region is flat. Um, yeah, it's just insane. I mean, can you imagine finding this in, you know, the 1860s? Just absolutely unbelievable. Um, so, yeah, that's the end of the articles. I want to go back and try to read a little bit of, was it this one? believe it was yeah the rocks don't lie so i'm going to try and read some of that which is here and we're going to swap <clears throat> um so yeah why we're winding down um anybody that wants to, that has a question or um a statement about something they know about um, Washington, anything at all, questions for me, feel free to ask now. I will actually be paying attention, which I'm doing a horrible job of. I apologize. Um, we're going to just talk a little bit about this book <clears throat> before we end here. Um, I apologize. Let's, let's make this come in. There we go. That's too big. Okay, so this book is The Rocks Don't Lie by the gentleman I had mentioned before. And we're just going to read a little bit from chapter 11 called The Heretic's Flood. And basically this author, um, he he kind of uses the, the catchphrase of Noah's flood. He's not necessarily saying that Noah's flood was what took place here, but he's saying something biblically large a biblically large flood cataclysm um, he mentions several things vulcan volcanism um, earthquakes i think they're often tied in with one another louisiana history ian oh you know i do um i have family in louisiana i have family in georgia florida and tennessee um i spent a lot of my summers in the south um unfortunately i'm kind of a ways away you know um, so my plan right now is, as I mentioned earlier, is I'm going to do Oregon next week, California the following week, Arizona the following week, Colorado the following week. That's as far as I've gotten. Um, I'm considering staying on the southern part of America uh, just because I love that area so much. And I've spent a lot of time in um, Texas, Louisiana, the south. And I have so much good stuff from there. So I think I might stay on the southern part of the states. Um, paper, newspaper stuff is really uh, difficult because of the territories that were established in the 1800s. You know, the Oregon Territory was quite large. Um, you know, Montana, Nevada, Wyoming, as we know them today, the Dakotas, they were quite different. and the papers varied a lot. So I, it, organizing all that is kind of daunting to me at this time. And I just already have so much to talk about for the next four. And perhaps the following month, 
So week five will be New Mexico, week six, um, Texas, week seven, uh, Louisiana. So hopefully that answers it, Ian. But yes, I have tons of stuff on Louisiana, tons, tons and tons, tons from the South. You know, the the papers are a lot more dense, um, especially Louisiana. There's such a deep history there. Um, you know, there's even good French newspapers, which I'm not going to translate because that's so much work, but the, the history there is, is, is very old. So, so to answer your question, Ian, I'm probably seven weeks away from doing Louisiana, but that's, that's a rough estimate. So, um, don't hold me to that, but yeah, that's what I'm thinking right now is that I'm going to stay on the Southern part of America as I do this exploring America series. Um, what's what's everybody's feelings on this you're in the deep south deep oh cool yeah yeah i love the south it's like a second home to me um first time i took my wife back there she fell in love with it if we were ever to relocate it would be to probably georgia my family has a a, um, bunch of land in northern georgia and uh it's one of our favorite places in the world uh what what can i do differently with these series, is it, uh, um, should I? Is there something you'd like to see more of that I cover? Should I? Should I do? Um, should I be a little more diverse and cover a little bit um, less specific and just a little bit more of different things? Um, yeah, I'm all for hearing about any of the states. Really, okay, cool. I can't wait for Michigan. There's going to be a ton on Michigan. Michigan, the Great Lakes region, I have a lot on. Salix, I got tons on Carolina. Yeah, I mean, this, you know, the southern states, it's really just the states I mentioned. Um, unfortunately, just Montana, Wyoming, the Dakotas. I have a lot from the Dakotas, but because they were territories and they weren't separated by north and south, it's going to be a little tricky to do north and south. <clears throat> Hidden history in Utah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. I re- that's a great point. I don't. I can't skip Utah. My my wife's family's from Utah. I have an unbelievable amount of stuff for for Utah and Nevada too. So you see, it's just tricky. I don't know. It's hard hopping around. I was originally going to do it by the starting with the first state to be part of the union and moving from there. And like well, you know, Delaware's there's just not so much there. You'd be surprised how hush hush. Um, the best relicy archaeology stuff, which is what I really love, is is west of the Mississippi. You know, it's just kind of like people, people. You're out by yourself in the middle of nowhere, and you know the the Smithsonian and all of these bureaucratic um, people didn't have far reach out there, so they got away with a lot more, and they got to see a lot more, and more more public got to see it, more papers got to write about it. So it's actually a little more difficult to find archaeological stuff on the east coast just because there was a lot more oversight oh thanks ian i appreciate that all 52 states all information is valuable for us um yeah i'm i'm gonna try and do them all um yeah there are some states believe it or not that are really hard like i i maybe could make a half an hour um episode on what are your thoughts on the lakes drying up out west? What do you mean, Joe? Um, in this time period, in the 1800s, early 1900s, or you mean right now? Um, if you mean right now, I would, I think it's it's all planned. Um, the way California, the subterranean water, um, has been has been controlled since the 1900s. Um, these same people, these same characters we discuss over and over, you know, the dark counter players, um, controlling the subterranean water was really important in California as some of the most. And I think it's, it's being controlled and manipulated. Bolts on the ground here in Northwest Montana, great hot springs here. Bolts on the ground. Do you mean boots? I don't, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, yeah, Montana's amazing. I love Montana. I haven't spent much time there, but I have been to Montana. Cali Spell is one of my favorite places. <sighs> and a half an hour is fine. You could put a couple together. Yeah, there'll be a few states that are maybe an hour, you know. But uh, 
I've invested a lot of time in these Western states just because I've spent a lot of time. I've spent a lot of time in Arizona, Utah, California, Oregon, Idaho, Washington. Thanks, Bernie. Thanks for being here. Uh, don't tell them about my rock hunting spots. <laughs> Prime fishing. I'll try not to. Yeah, there's a lot of amazing rock hunting. Um, I was really obsessed with rocks as a kid. And uh, yeah, there's so much good um, rock hunting in eastern Washington, eastern Oregon. Tons and tons. Uh, I'm going to the library today. Motivation to research. Oh, thanks. Thank you. There doesn't seem to be much of this stuff in Wisconsin. Oh, I got some good stuff in Wisconsin. We could we could do a good episode of Wisconsin. Only a few states I've heard of. I'd love if someone would investigate. Yeah, we could do it for sure. Maine. Yeah. Maine has uh, some pretty interesting old buildings, you know, but uh, the history on them is really, was really blurry. Maine's tricky. Um, like I said, I've, I've I've dug into most states pretty deep. And Maine and Vermont, again, this is why I'm, I'm letting people know that as I get closer to their state, and I'm going to, every week I'm going to be telling them what states I'm, I'm doing next, that they can hopefully reach out and send me links and I can get more stuff to talk about. Because obviously, you know, there's a lot of states and enough material to talk for a few hours or at least present something um, that people are interested in. It could be a little, a little hard. If you talk faster, you'll get more in the amount of time. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Um, the reality is too, is that, uh, you know, this is only my second episode and I'm pretty new to the, to the uh, live streaming thing, Jack. So, but I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm mostly just meandering because I'm, my my way of laying out the episode is a little unorthodox so but i appreciate that feedback thank you um yeah so we'll just go over this book and if anyone's interested in it <clears throat> there's quite a few free copies online and like i said it was called the rocks don't lie um basically this author is hypothesizing that part of what uh created a lot of the formations of what they call the scab lands which uh you know, could be a plasma event. Um, there's a lot of proof. There's a lot of, I wouldn't want to say proof. There's a lot of good evidence out there that um, there was a some kind of an electrical event, especially on the western states, west of the Mississippi. Um, and I would say the Scablands show incredibly clear evidence of that. Um <clears throat> smile more and apologize less. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. Um, but yeah. Um, so yeah, keep your comments coming. Um, like I said, California, Oregon, California, Colorado, Arizona. Those are the next four for sure. After that, I probably do Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, and then Texas. So saying Louisiana is seven away, it was probably a lie. It's probably more like nine. But again, that's just uh, loose. Oklahoma is interesting. Yeah. Oklahoma is incredibly interesting. I got a lot of good stuff from Oklahoma. Um, Yeah, it is. It is early for sure. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm not quite, I get up early, but this is still early to try to present something. But again, my time is limited. So I'm just trying to fit this in. So doing a live chat at five in the morning, it's, you know, obviously silly. So I'm grateful for everybody that is here. And, uh, it means a lot. And, you know, you know, I appreciate even the, the, the more criticizing feedback. So, you know, that's, it's okay. Um, because I know I do a lot of rambling. <clears throat> in fact, I got that as a complaint on my last episode was, you know, having a more clear outline. So I tried to, uh, do it geographically, but even then I was bouncing around a little bit. Okay, so I'm just going to do a quick little uh, read over of this. Uh, basically, he's talking about that he worked in uh, for a university, and he had never uh, ventured to. <clears throat> he had never ventured into Eastern Washington, and blah blah blah. And um, he goes on to say that uh, 
The temperature rainforest of western Washington was miles behind us. The lack of plants made it easy to see the landforms. Once across the Columbia River, we continued eastward, driving up onto a plateau where swirly winds blew soil off freshly plowed fields. Racing the dust devils, we dropped into the Mosses Coulee, a canyon which, with vertical walls of layered basalt half buried beneath ramps. Nothing had removed the rocks that fell to the valley floor. They just piled up in place, right where gravity left them. We stopped, gathered the students. Um, He's just talking about the the geography um, and how strange it is. Water scorched cliff, now dry waterfall, hundreds of feet high. So he's talking about the same area that I was just mentioning. Um, After European geologists dismissed its central role, role, for a catastrophic flood in early history, the idea became geological heresy. Although J. Harlan Bretz uncovered evidence of giant floods in eastern Washington in the 1920s, it took most of the 20th century for other geologists to believe him. Geologists had so thoroughly denied the existence of great floods that they could not believe it when somebody actually found evidence for one. A controversial figure throughout his career, Bretz won no awards until long after he retired and his most influential and voice for his critics had died. There was no volume written by distinguished colleagues to honor his career. He was an outsider, a heretic dismissed by the scientific establishment. A classic field geologist, Bretz figured out the story of the region's giant glacial floods, seeing what others at first could not and then would not see to sort out the pieces of the landscape scale jigsaw puzzle. Bretz became unpopular when he questioned orthodox uniformitarianism. Lyles dictate that the process of today are the same as those of the past. Fresh out of graduate school and perhaps not knowing any better, Bretz identified compelling evidence for a gigantic flood. A reluctant heretic, he insisted on valuing field evidence above theory, piecing together the story of how a raging wall of hundreds of water hundreds of feet high roared across eastern Washington, carving deep channels before cascading down the Columbia River Gorge as a wall of water high enough to turn Oregon's Willamette Valley into a vast backwater lake. This time it was the scientific community that refused to see the evidence. Vying to be the first to prove himself wrong, Bretz kept digging. But as he kept finding more evidence of a really big flood, the geological establishment kept coming up with ways of (coughs) of explaining it away. Brett's taught in his native Michigan before heading heading west to teach high school in Seattle. A field enthusiast, he spent his weekends summers studying the geology around Puget Sound as well as glaciers in nearby Cascade Range. Uh, Blah, blah, blah. Brett's found exotic, exotic granite boulders perched on basalt cliff, hundreds of feet above the highest recorded river level. Glaciers could not have carried these boulders to these elevations. Geological evidence has already proven glaciers had never reached the gorge. His colleagues thought this part of the Cascade Range lay submerged beneath the Pacific Ocean when the boulders arrived, carried by floating ice. Finding no evidence of marine fossils or ancient beaches, however, Bretz concluded the boulders must have been deposited by fresh water. What could have generated such an enormous flood? So that's why I wanted to end that. Um, I I recommend the book. Um, basically, you know, this is a geologist in the you know late '90s talking about exactly what we were saying, um, and you know, he's not really looking at the newspaper articles and the other stuff we're talking about. Um, and I kind of just want to leave you guys with um, let's do. Let's do Cooley. I just want to leave you guys with this picture. Um, you're welcome to look into more pictures of this yourself. Um, before they flooded this area, you can find a lot of older drawings of it still. Um, but, um, yeah, they uh, similar story to like the Grand Canyon. Um there was a move to say prehistoric men, men painted <clears throat> um, mystic picture right on the wall. Um, so the Grand Coulee Dam, as they started to dam the river, um, they found tons and tons of petroglyphs and um, petrographs. 
and the Secretary of State Hutchinson urged the photographing of the untranslated writings. These rock writings contain the secrets of the earliest human race in this state. They will be permanently inundated by the Cooley Dam, and it would be a crime not to preserve a complete record of these petroglyphs and petroglyphs. Hutchinson believed deciphering of these writings by future students might solve the riddle of an ancient race that preceded the American Indians. So yeah, Noah's flood, some kind of flood, hundreds and hundreds of feet high, creating uh, some of these things that we've talked about today. And um, yeah, I could do a show for 10 hours on Washington and I could probably just talk for two hours about the, the Grand Coulee. Um, but yeah, these geological formations. So sh I think they bring a, a, a picture and that map I showed earlier really does a good job of that as well. That um, there was a giant inland sea. Um, and that the ice age probably was a lot closer to our time frame than we know. Mm. And yeah, um, 